Good afternoon, good morning and evening if some of you are joining us from different time zones today. And so welcome to the third and last webinar. How can we take AMR advocacy to the next level, including policy making? Um, as, I, as I told you, this is the third and last webinar of this webinar series. And the objective of this series was to create a space for a diverse group of patients to share stories and connect and engage with, uh, with other groups um, about AMR advocacy. I'm Francesca Chiara, and I'm the chair of the AMR Narrative, and I'm joined today by Vanessa Carter, who's the executive director of the AMR Narrative, but also chair of the WHO Task Force of AMR Survivors, and Elena Balestra, head of governance and membership and capacity building at the European Patient Forum. So the first webinar uh, featured patient groups and patient advocates um, discussing how to improve advocacy while the second webinar um, focused more on various stakeholders and um, reflected on how to better engage communities on this issue. And now with the third webinar, um, we are digging deeper down into um, how to uh, move to the next level. So how to engage um, the policymakers in, uh, in conducting effective advocacy. And this is in preparation of the United Nations General Assembly that will discuss AMR um, later uh, this, this month. So today um, we, uh, we, will, we will hear patient stories from two patient survivors, Rob Purdy and John Kariuki. Um, we also have an introduction from Vanessa Carter about the WHO task force of AMR survival. And then we will conclude with a panel discussion with experts and, uh, and, and patients representatives. So um, I, I would like to just um, quickly um, give you some housekeeping rules. Um, so please uh, mute yourself when you're speaking, use your headset and earphones if you have them, and please use the chat box uh, in case of uh, technical issues. And also you can use the Q&A uh, chat if you would like to ask questions, especially during the, um, during the panel session. So I would like to give you some uh, some. Um, a brief uh, explanation about uh, introduction about the MR narrative. So the MR narrative is a very young uh, patient organization, which is UK based. It was launched um, last year with three uh, key aims. Um, the first aim is to uh, make knowledge about AMR accessible, especially to patient groups and to the wider um, community. The second is to um, show and highlight patient stories um, about resistant infections, but most of all is to create um, advocacy capacity among patient groups so they can conduct effective advocacy when telling about the stories, but they can also bring the issue at the, at the political level. Um, and so I'm going to pass, uh, pass it to Elena, which will give an introduction about the work of the European Patient Forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca. So the European Patients Forum is an independent, not governmental umbrella. We were funded in 2003, and we currently represent 79 members that are either national coalitions or EU disease-specific organizations, which means that those organizations are either uh, organizations that have a very wide geographical focus, sometimes either EU, Europe, or even uh, international, but with a strong uh, geographical focus on, on Europe, um, and are and on the other hand, they have a very specific uh, disease focus um, or national coalitions, which means that our organization have a very specific uh, geographical focus, like a specific country, but they do cover several uh, conditions. So this is uh, who we represent. And you can hear, um, you can see here below our vision and, and our mission. Thank you.
thank you so much, uh, Elena and Francesca. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so as mentioned, uh, I'm uh, currently the executive director of the AMON Narrative. And one of the things I'm going to do in my presentation is talk about the task force, the WHO task force for AMR survivors, as we have two um, very, very uh, respectable patient advocates that are going to share their stories as members of the task force. Um, next slide, please. So as a brief background, I'm not going to spend too much time on my story. Um, obviously, storytelling is important. Um, so I had a car accident in Johannesburg uh, in 2004. I had uh, many, many different injuries, uh, including to my face, to my abdominal uh, region, to I had a fractured pelvis, neck and back injury. Um, next slide, please. This is a snapshot of what I went through over 10 years to reconstruct my face because that was the most complicated. Um, next slide, please. When I had my fourth prosthetic implanted, um, I was diagnosed with MRSA or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. This was a test result on the right-hand side. Lots of R's, meaning I was resistant to the type of antibiotics they were giving me, and some S's, uh, about five S's that meant I was susceptible, meaning those kinds of antibiotics did work. But after a very long uh, journey, uh, you know, for three years fighting infections, this is what my face looked like because the bacterial infection that was resistant to antibiotics had eaten away most of the skin. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we did a bone reconstruction to try and avoid too many surgeries. Um, and as you can see on the top right hand side, uh, this is what my face looks like today. Um, when they did this particular surgery called the zygomatic osteotomy or bone reconstruction in the face. Um, next slide, please. Um, but the infection returned. And by this time, it was the fifth time that I was fighting the resistant infection. Um, and so what happened was the doctors rotated antibiotics and eventually, uh, next slide, please. Um, this was the result, which I know is not perfect because I do have a facial disfigurement left from it, but I was extremely relieved that uh, the infection had finally cleared. And I was quite fortunate that it didn't turn into anything uh, more serious, such as a bloodstream infection or sepsis. Um, next slide, please. So this webinar is based on, you know, we as patients, we go through these journeys. Um, in 2013, after I finished my facial reconstruction and fought all those infections, I became a patient advocate. And one of the biggest things for me was because AMR or antibiotic resistance in my case, was not common knowledge. It frustrated me that it wasn't being communicated clearly enough. So these are kind of photos of the different work that I've done, including working in policy making and including working in medical education. Um, the purple graphic in the middle is actually a stewardship team at the Charlotte McSeke Johannesburg Academic Hospital that invited me back to share my patient story to help the nurses and the doctors working in that stewardship team to understand the importance of um, how, you know, or how they could be working better and understanding the human impact of what it felt like as a patient to deal with those recurring infections. Uh, next slide, please. So um, later on in my journey, I was appointed a chair of the WHO Task Force of AMR Survivors. Um, the top left-hand photo shows the 12 survivors that con you know, the membership is made up of. We all have different lived experiences of AMR. And this is really, really important because AMR is uh, what they call the cornerstone of modern medicine um, because it impacts any single disease or condition, including surgical interventions like mine that relies on antibiotics to cure them. So um, we have uh, members from uh, the USA and Canada. We have members from India, Zimbabwe, Indonesia, the USA, Kenya, Nigeria, Lebanon, um, and the UK. Um, and basically, our task is to go out there, share our stories, um, to make an impact on policymaking, to really bring the human face to the problem, um, instead of just talking about numbers and statistics um, and the technical framing of what AMR actually is. Uh, next slide. So um, these are some of the uh, materials that we've created as the task force of AMR survivors. Um, there's a QR code at the bottom if you'd like to scan it to learn more. 
Um, we have three videos at the moment um, that we'd like to encourage you to share, but also the other assets that we've got, because again, there's 12 members. Um, and uh, the hashtag that we use at the moment is hashtag AMR survivors. Next slide. So this is a really, really important document. And if you're a patient advocate only entering the realm of AMR advocacy for the first time, this is going to be really helpful to you. Um, so if you go onto the website page, and you can see at the bottom left-hand side, it's the, the website page is listed there. Um, this was put together by the 12 members of the task force. And what we really focus on is um, different avenues that you can explore. So you don't just have to do policy making. You might want to work in medical education and so on, um, but your story matters. Um, and so this is really uh, what we've worked on uh, between all of us, uh, you know, to, to be able to make it, to be able to provide it to technical experts and again, patients and the public to, to show them avenues in terms of how they can be involved. Um, next slide. So I'm just very briefly going to go through, this is the same document. We've highlighted 10 different areas. So that could range from anywhere from public awareness, sharing your story, um, you know, working with the media and so on, um, health worker education. As I said, I've, I've personally worked with quite a few different universities um, and academics to share my story, to bring to light when, when you know, when, when medical students are taught about AMR, um, when they hear the personal perspective of survival, how they can improve uh, their response to AMR. Um, policy making, as I said, very, very important because this is a very technical issue. When we share our stories, uh, it makes it more relatable to policymakers and potentially changes policies. Um, uh, next slide, please. So national action plans, uh, this is also something that I've been grateful to be involved with. Um, we can be powerful champions to, uh, you know, bring forward the, what do we go through in the health system. And, you know, it shouldn't just be another uh, a political gesture to put in place a national action plan. We need to be listening to people on the ground um, to design these national action plans. Otherwise, they will not be patient and people centered. Um, and so, again, uh, this is something that we could seek out as patients to work with our local governments to say, well, you know, why is there not a task force? Why is your ministerial advisory committee uh, not involving patients or even uh, patient organisations in developing these national action plans? So I thought I'd brought that, bring that to light. Um, your story does matter. Um, publications, I've been involved in 11 publications so far. I've co-authored some of them. I do not have a scientific background, but what I have relied on is mentorship from the researchers and the academics um, and other patients as well for me, be, for me to be able to contribute my views towards these uh, publications that are really, really important, again, and also inform policymaking. Um, medical conferences, we share our stories, again, for people and for healthcare professionals that don't understand, don't always understand what the human impact is. Uh, public health innovation, if we start to talk about artificial intelligence or, uh, you know, uh, the way that we share data, AMR surveillance and so on. Um, I'll speak for myself, you know, I've moved from South Africa to the UK recently. My medical record is still in South Africa. It's not in the UK. I often have to volunteer that information. Um, you know, medical records need to be following us across borders. Um, and of course, research and development is really important uh, in terms of diagnostics and uh, new novel therapies and so on. So um, this is my last slide. And I think that uh, it, it, in terms of saying that now, I would like to introduce two of our task force members. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry, could you go to the previous slide just before I move on to that? So, the, uh, sorry, just to end on this, um, as Elena mentioned, we've got the important date of the UN General Assembly high level meeting on AMR in 2024. And, you know, as, as patient advocates, we could really raise our voices. We don't necessarily have to be there, but social media is a powerful tool to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, so, but the stories are really going to impact that outcome. The other thing is uh, World AMR Awareness Week, which happens every year. Um, between the 18th and 24th of November 2024 and actually this year the um, 
the topic is educate, advocate, and act now. And um, as you can see, you know they've put a very strong emphasis on our task force and on patient stories. So um, yeah, next slide, please. So having said that, I'd like to introduce um, John Kariuki, um, who is an amazing advocate. Um, he comes from Kenya. Um, he is a veterinary surgeon by profession and works as an assistant director in the Directorate of Veterinary Services in the State Department for Livestock Development. He holds a master's degree in the area of bacterial antimicrobial resistance and also serves in the WHO Task Force of AMR survivors. He is a member of the National Antimicrobial Resistance Stewardship Interagency Committee in Kenya. Um, in 2020, he developed a multi-drug resistant hospital acquired surgical site infection following an accidental right hip joint fracture. This um, occasioned prolonged hospitalization and a year long recumbency. Um, following recuperation, he now lives without the right hip joint and with a three inch shortening of the right leg. So um, I open the floor to you, John, and I just want to thank you so much for joining us from Kenya today. Thanks very much, Vanessa, for the, uh, for the introduction. Yes, uh, we can go to the next slide. Yes, AMR, uh, yeah, as you know, is uh, a phenomenon that is seen when uh, bugs or bacteria, either viruses, parasites, or fungi, fail to respond to the effects of a drug that they were previously sensitive to. And so this calls upon us to fight against AMR. Next slide, please. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, I've just defined what AMR is, and this is a, a major threat to global public health. It's one of the, of the top 10 major threats to global health. Uh, it has an annual mortality of 2.5 million people currently, but uh, uh, this can go up to 10 million by the year 2050 if nothing is done. And this could take us to the prehistoric, uh, the, the, the pre antibiotic era where. Uh, we are going to be probably um, uh, morbid of uh, minor infections. And uh, this uh, will negate the advances that have been made in modern medicine, especially, especially for major surgeries and cancer chemotherapy. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, we need to invest heavily in research. And uh, uh, some of the areas that we need to invest in is uh, in the small molecules that can. Uh, have to combat uh, AMR, especially for the uh, the AMR, the resistance that has developed against the current drugs in use. The other thing is development of bacteriophages. These are other bacteria or viruses that feed on bacteria, and uh, therefore they, they 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 are not antibiotics, and so probably you cannot get resistance uh, against bacteriophages. And the other thing, important thing, is use of vaccines to do infection prevention uh, uh, control. And this way, uh, we would minimize the need for use uh, of antibiotics. And this would probably be able to uh, hamper development of resistance. The other uh, area of research is investment in strain-specific antibiotics, which uh, will ensure that we use narrow spectrum antibiotics, so broad spectrum antibiotics. Right? Next slide, please. Yes, we are vulnerable and in the One Health approach, uh, the environment, animals, humans, and as well as crops in agriculture, we are vulnerable. Next slide, please. Yes, my story started on 6th of October 2020 when I uh, had an accidental slip and fall. And uh, this was uh, followed by a misdiagnosis where they missed the fracture. And so, uh, the geography wasn't uh, very clear, so we did computerized tomography. And this is when the, the, the real uh, problem was uh, visualized, and there was a complete fracture of the hip joint. The fever, the, or rather the thymus, was completely separated from its bone and away from the pelvis. Next slide, please. 
So uh, I underwent surgery to try and correct it by putting in plates and screws uh, into the hip joint. Uh, that surgical procedure was done about three weeks later because of misdiagnosis of uh, that happened in the first place. Next slide, please. And I was hospitalized for five months. I was uh, I went to five different hospitals. Uh, uh, five orthopedic surgeons were involved or consulted, and six physicians as well and over 10 healthcare workers. And during that time, I remember I had to undergo 11 pints of blood transfusion while I was uh, in hospital because the bloodstream infection had become so severe, had become so septic, and this was threatening uh, function of some organs like the kidneys. And um, this 11 pints had to be given by donors. Next slide, please. Uh, I was released from hospital uh, five months later after being hospitalized uh, in uh, two or three hospitals. Then I, I, I went home for recuperation. And during that time, I had a full-time nurse with me. And uh, he slept in my bedroom. And I also started undergoing physiotherapy. During this time, the only thing that uh, was happening was the wounded dresser would come. Uh, from the same hospital I had been hospitalized and he would come twice a week. He would clean the wound using iodides and then go away. And so the wound continued oozing. Next slide, please. So in August, I decided to take action and I did uh, a culture and sensitivity testing uh, in the reputable laboratory. Uh, and out of 18 antibiotics, only one was working. And uh, this... Uh, drug was amikacin, uh, and what was found, the bacteria that was involved was uh, Citrobacter frundi, uh, together with the uh, uh, Morganella morganae. And uh, uh, when I administered the drug in the first week of August, uh, we went down from dressing the wound four times a day to around twice uh, a day by the end of October. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And in September, uh, we started dressing the wound only once. Uh, in October, I took another culture and sensitivity testing, and this turned out negative, just in good time for me to participate in the World uh, uh, Antimicrobial Awareness Week of November 2021, where I shared my testimony, uh, but I still continue to do physiotherapy. Uh, all the while, and I still do physiotherapy up to today. Uh, but this occasion a pre inch shortening of my right leg. Next slide, please. And so I live uh, with I'm a person officially uh, registered uh, with the Kenya government as a person living with a disability. And of course, the impacts of this included uh, uh, mental uh, torture. Let me call it mental torture or mental disturbance. Of course, physically, when I used to play football, now I can only just watch and clap for the people who do things I used to do, and now I'm unable to do. Of course, it had a social impact because I could no longer mingle socially as much as I, I did uh, before. The cost uh, of uh, hospitalizing me, the hospital bill was about 35,000 US dollars. Uh, but the cost of treating myself after culture and sensitivity testing was a little less than $50. And you can count the losses in current because I was unable, I was bedridden for, uh, for almost a year. A whole year I was bedridden. And so this impacted negatively on my socioeconomic activities. So the, the cost, the burden of uh, AMR uh, can be seen in this example. Uh, of mine, of loss of a daily adjusted life years. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, those impacts, as you can see, sports, I can no longer do sports. Social, I can no longer mingle that with. Although now I can because I've uh, fairly recovered. And peculiarly, uh, just out, uh, just measured. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
Yeah, so what we are saying, uh, the global initiatives, uh, starting with the, with, the, with the global action plan that was developed in 2015 and uh, and spearheaded by uh, the quadripartite. Now, uh, uh, no, the tripartite, uh, but later became quadripartite after UNEP joined. And in 2023, uh, the WHO task force of AMR survivors was formed. And this, is, has contributed greatly to advocacy, where we need to take uh, this um, story to uh, the political leadership of the world, because it's a global problem. It's not a problem that is regional. And if uh, these leaders can be uh, made to internalize that the problem is actually global and that they are also vulnerable, then probably more resources can be allocated towards combating this uh, uh, this uh, 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 silent pandemic. We are saying that this pandemic is invisible, but we are visible. And so we must use ourselves, as uh, the chairman said, uh, as task force members to try and acknowledge that is necessary for um, more energy to be geared towards combating this. And in Kenya, we have uh, the National Action Plan, which we have developed. And I think we are going to, we already renewed the phase from 23, uh, 2023 to 2027 with the six strategies, uh, where we are going to look at government governance and coordination, public awareness and education, surveillance and monitoring of the antimicrobial resistance profiles all over the country, uh, infection prevention and control, uh, that is use of vaccines, and promotion of wash activities with water, sanitation, and hygiene, as well as appropriate use of antimicrobials. And the other thing, very important, I covered it, is research and development, which we cannot do without. Next. Yes, uh, um, I'm happy to be with you. And thank you very much for my short story about the very long period of time that I was hospitalized. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much for sharing your story. We we really, really appreciate it. I think, again, you know, just to go back to that, this is not just, um, you know, we want we want to try to tackle AMR in, in, you know, on local uh, levels. It's really, really important to do that. Um, but it's also an, it's important to understand it from a global perspective because AMR um, crosses borders. So um, the next speaker is Rob Purdy um, from the USA, um, and he is a lifelong California resident who has uh, who was diagnosed with cocci meningitis in 2012, the most severe type of valley fever. Um, Rob relies on daily antifungals to control his disease and has used his experience to help other patients and become a leading fungal disease patient advocate. In 2023, Rob founded Marke, the first patient-led hand fungal nonprofit with a goal to bring fungal patients together to share knowledge and experience and advocate for better care and increased um, research for their disease. Rob is becoming a sought-after speaker and key opinion leader in the fungal and AMR communities. Rob's legislative efforts have included state and national legislation and appropriations to support fungal research and awareness. And he is also um, a valued member of the WHO Task Force of AML Survivors. So um, welcome, Rob, and thank you so much for sharing your story. I think Rob, we might be battling to hear your uh your audio. Is that better or worse? Much better. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Please go ahead. All right. So next slide, please. So um, unlike Vanessa and John's AMR experience, mine wasn't caused by an accident or injury. Um, some AMR infections are just caused by 
being being alive. So mine was caused by, <clears throat> excuse me, a fungus that's just commonly inhaled in parts of the world. So all I did was take a breath. And then my symptoms began in 2012. Uh, it took me only six weeks to get diagnosed, which is uh, sometimes rare when it comes to fungal infections, which often are not thought of initially, everybody assumes bacterial or viral, so sometimes it takes a while to get to those. Um, the good news is a lot of these environmental fungal infections don't exist in Europe, but because we live in a world where people travel quite frequently, I actually know patients with this disease who live in Europe, including one who lives in the UK. Um, so after diagnosis, I was started on antifungals, um, and my symptoms started to get better. But my first hospital readmission was in October of 2012, um, which was 10 months after diagnosis because the drug I was on failed. Uh, next slide, please. So I failed a series of three different pills, oral medications for my disease before uh, they put me on a combination of two different therapies uh, to control my fungal infection. And that worked but because of side effects, I failed both of those therapies. Uh, I am happy to say that for coming up on a decade, I have been um, well controlled, uh, but not cured of my infection uh, with a combination of two drugs. Um, so unfortunately my, my condition is incurable, but it is controllable. Next slide, please. Um, and as, as John indicated, you know, the, the burden of disease is more than just the, ho the cost of hospitalization and the procedures. Uh, there's, there's the socioeconomic impacts. Um, I have a lot fewer friends than I had. Uh, I missed tons of work. Um, the economic impact of the disease was crippling. Um, and then since then, you know, I've battled with depression and isolation. And not only that, um, my spouse, my partner, has had panic attacks, uh, which she did not have prior to my diagnosis. So the, the, the indirect costs aren't just on, borne by the patient, they're borne by the care, carers as well. Next slide. Um, and from a patient perspective, one thing that I saw, especially with AMR, which is, is I kind of view it as a rare disease. My, my disease is rare. And, and so looking at it from a rare disease lens, um, because of the lack of knowledge, you know, we find that clinicians lack knowledge, information, and support, and patients don't have a, re a reliable and, and consistent experience. They don't get good information, and they don't understand what's going on. Uh, next slide. And part of the, the, the question that I ask people when it comes to AMR is, what level of risk are we willing to accept? You know, if your house was on fire, which one of these pieces of equipment do you want to show up? Um, and the difference between the equipment on the left and the equipment on the right is what we as the public and as um, advocates are willing to allow. And so we have the ability to make the difference between these two options by working together and advocating. Next slide. And a lot of lessons can be learned from the AIDS epidemic in the 80s and 90s. Um, in that epidemic, the, the difference was made by patients. Um, the difference was made by those impacted. The reason it was successful was because when patients became involved, there was a lot of support, but it was started by patients. Um, the support was, was quicker in coming than it has been for AMR but it was patient-led. Um, so next slide, please. So obviously, um, as part of the AMR task force, we, sh we say that AMR is invisible, but I am not. And I want to talk a little bit about how I've become visible. Um, so, you know, like John, like Vanessa, like the other people that you'll hear speak in, and on the panel, um, you know, I, I was frustrated by the by my diagnosis. I was frustrate, frustrated by uh, the difficulty I had in, in, in uh, getting the care I needed or getting the answers I needed. And so 
uh, I decided to take action. Um, but how did I get started? Simply by reaching out to members of my community. I reached out to my physician. I reached out to my local representative and I said, how do I get involved? Do you know any organizations? What do you know? Help me look. And they did. And um, I was lucky that those people uh, that I went to first were able to help me. And they connected me to an organization, uh, an organization that I'm still involved with today that's a nonprofit that works on Valley Fever. And through that, uh, we I was able to help them advance their platform while also creating a platform for myself to engage uh, at the state level and the local level um, with legislators leading to legislation that addressed the way testing was done and also allocating funds for education, awareness, and research about the disease. Uh, I also was able to have impact at the, at the national level. So after I um, got some experience at the state level over a couple of years, I was able to have some impact at the federal level. Um, and there's there's some strength in being a patient there's some there's some opportunity that comes with that so if you are a politician or a researcher or a policymaker or an, even an ngo that is not patient-led you are expected to behave a certain way uh, patients are given a little bit of leeway we don't get to be rude we shouldn't try to be rude we don't get to be um anything other than polite but sometimes we get to bend the rules a little that's extremely useful um, because you can ask for forgiveness um, and, and you'll often get it if you go a little if you color slightly outside the lines um, next slide so you know that's led to having some recent uh, abilities to engage at the world AMR Congress um, and and you know part of this is being able to work with this organization and ask for a keynote panel of, of uh, patients and suggesting that and making an appropriate suggestion that they found interesting. And because of that, we just had a, key, a, a panel of patients. Next slide. And through networking with the, the WHO Task Force of AMR Survivors, they've also given me a platform. And because of that, I was able to speak to representatives at the G20 Healthcare Summit last week in Brazil. Uh, next slide. So I have a motto and a mantra um, that I've stolen. And it's that the people who are crazy enough to think that can change the world are the ones who do. So I would encourage those of you who are considering uh, getting involved in advocacy, those who are looking for opportunities to do so. Uh, on the fungal side of, of the equation in Europe, I've had the opportunity to work with a couple great organizations uh, that are clinical in nature, the European uh, Confederation of Mental Mycology, and uh, a group called ESCMID, European Society for Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Disease. So I found a lot of support, and I think if you want to be involved and expand your footprint in AMR, that you will have the same success I have. So you can go to the next slide. And that's just a little bit about my organization, and I'll turn it back over to Vanessa. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Uh, thank you so much, Rob, and also to John. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, these stories are so important. Um, you know, as you said, this is how we, uh, you know, we, we take it to the policymaking level, and this is all, you know, what we're trying to discuss today. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, so we've got a panel discussion following this um, with some in uh, amazing, uh, some people also uh, that have also got different experiences of AMR, um, and working in the policy space. So I'd like to hand over to Alina Balestra to um, to continue with that discussion. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And I'm very happy to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have um, about four, 25 minutes for, for our panelists to discuss. And I will be joined in this virtual panel by Antonella Cardone, who is the CEO of Cancer Patients Europe, a pan-European health cancer patient association. Uh, she's a patient uh, advocacy expert, and she wore many hats in her life, and she led uh, previously the European Cancer Patient Coalition, and she had several leading roles in the not-profit health and employment sector in Europe. Welcome, Antonella. 
And Antonella will be joined by Dr. Marlene Grape, uh, who is the government ambassador on antimicrobial resistance since March 2022. She represents Sweden and the Swedish multisectoral work to counteract IMR and its consequences in EU, as well as international fora, advocating for cooperation and reinforced global action. She has a wealth of experience on IMR, and she worked on the topic of the different roles. Dr. Grape is a silenced, licensed uh, pharmacist and holds a PhD in Medical Science from Karolinska Institute. Welcome, Malin. And then we have also uh, Diane Shader smith who is a communications professional publicist and also a patient advocate. Um, she has a quite a long career and uh, Diane has established herself as a prominent figure in the field of public relations, marketing and crisis communication. And she's best known in this field of health advocacy for her passion on advocacy and fundraising efforts for antimicrobial resistance. And she was inspired in joining the advocacy uh, word uh, by her uh, late daughter, Marley Smith, who bravely battled a superbug. Welcome, Diane. And last but not least, um, our list, last panelist is Anna Bartakova, who is the Interim Director at Health First Europe and IMR Patient Group. Anna has a robust background in European health affair with a decade of experience within EU framework. She holds, she holds different positions in the Brussels bubble. And Anna, she's also been managing the first European IMR patient group since August 2023. So welcome to our uh, panelists uh, that you see all on, on camera. And I prepared a few uh, questions for you, uh, starting with Diane. Diane, it is not e always easy for patients to gain access to policymakers. From your own experience as a patient advocate, how do you go from telling your personal story to engaging with policymaker and influencing policy. Was this a natural move for you or can you tell us a little bit about it? For me, it was a natural move because my profession is public relations and marketing. So I would not use myself as an example of an average person in terms of how they would do it. But for me, what happened was I told Mallory's story in a way that got people's attention and I kept telling it over and over and over. And after a while, you learn how to tell the story better, which I, I think happens to anybody. And I had an opportunity to speak to some very high level people early on, and then they referred me to other people. So in my case, it was just talking and talking and talking. For people who don't have any training at all, and a lot of people have really compelling stories, but they don't know how to tell them. And I, if I were to advocate for one thing that people walk away from this with, if they want to be a patient advocate or they want to be better at that, is to find someone who is a professional storyteller to take your story and tell it in a way that evokes emotion. And I I don't wanna go on and on because we don't have very long, but that that's the simple key message Learn how to tell your story in a way that isn't just about the facts, the figures, the surgeries you've had, the antibiotics that failed, but who you are as a person. What are you losing? What have you lost? I mean, Rob just did it now when he said his wife uh, has had panic attacks. That's a perfect example of a key detail that makes his story more compelling. When he starts to talk about which antibiotics fail, personally, I gloss over. It's when the human element, element of storytelling comes into play that you start to really see traction and people really pay attention. Thank you, Diane. And I'm now uh, have a question for Malin. Um, you represent Sweden and participate actively in EU work and um, in international forums, including the UN. In your experience, do policymakers listen to patients and patient organizations? What, what do they need uh, from them? Absolutely. I would say, uh, from my experience, the, the patient perspective is incredibly important. Um, I mean, a desk product and policy and action plan is not worth very much unless you have really um, co-created and developed it together with the people concerned. It's not only the patients, of course, but patients are a crucial 
uh, stakeholder for this. And it's not only about the development of this policy, but especially for the implementation, we have to make sure that you can really implement it and with the support from the concerned groups. I would also say that um, patients could very much hook up with professionals um, and have even stronger voices and, and more impact because together um, they have the different perspectives of, of the same um, challenges that you meet in the healthcare and in the, in the um, uh, treatment, I mean, first um, um, diagnostic, but also treatment of, of resistant infections. I would also say it's, um, it's about relatability. Policymakers also do need, I mean, they are people and they need to understand that this is really something that we are all at risk for. And that is not, that is not very well known. We all know that. And this is why I think these patient stories, but also maybe together with the professionals explaining how this is a challenge to their mission. Um, and we have to repeat it again and again and again, because even people affected by AMR are very often not even themselves aware of it. We, are, we all know, you know that we've been touched by cancer in one way or another, but, but most people don't know at all whether people were also affected by resistant infections. So I think there's really a lot to do. There's an incredibly important role. And I would also say, I mean, patient, if we talk about patients, there are so many patients, for example, the cancer patients that are so dependent on effective antibiotics. Um, so, so it's not only the, the people already affected by resistant infections, but we have so many other important patient groups that could raise their voices and contribute to this. But then you have to first feel that you are aware of it and engaged by it. So, so I think there is, there's really a lot to do, and especially when it comes to, to convincing the policymakers that we all have a role to play here. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Antonella, a question for you. Cancer is sometimes uh, presented as an example of successful patient advocacy, and it is a therapeutic area that receives attention from policymakers. What lessons have you learned from your experience in cancer advocacy that could be applied to antimicrobial resistance, in your view? Uh, thank you, uh, Elena. Uh, as uh, um, uh, antimicrobial resistant, uh, resistance is uh, a pressing issue for uh, cancer patients, and uh, this conversation now for me is very timely as uh, we are starting our engagement uh, on this uh, topic. We are currently a member of the steering committee uh, of a project that uh, Menarini has initiated, and we have contributed to a literature review uh, we will publish uh, the data soon, uh, but uh, uh, I can uh, um, uh, mention a, a few preliminary data which are impressive. Uh, so cancer patients are three times more likely to die from a fatal infection compared uh, with a patient uh, without cancer. Approximately 50% of death in cancer patients can be directly or indirectly linked to an infection. And uh, AMR infections are rarely recorded as the official cause of death on death certificates. AMR infections are a threat to the progress made in innovative uh, cancer treatments. And AMR may uh, make uh, some cancer treatments non-viable by 2030. And uh, in fact, uh, in a poll of uh, 100 uh, UK oncologists, 46% uh, were worried uh, that chemotherapy will soon uh, become non-viable due to uh, AMR. And uh, the threat of AMR negatively uh, affects uh, patients' quality of life. Uh, we heard uh, uh, before from uh, a patient's uh, uh, experience uh, about uh, the social isolation uh, that can happen independently of the infection, uh, just because of the fear of the infection. And uh, uh, another uh, argument that is very close to my heart is the cost implication of AMR. And the cost is higher than the cost of targeted antibiotic uh, treatment. So with these numbers at CPE, we cannot uh, uh, ignore uh, this issue. So what are the lessons learned from uh, previous uh, work that we did? 
So first of all, we need to generate political will and influence policymakers. And we can influence policymakers through building and presenting a unified voice between patients, healthcare providers, and researchers. We need to work together. We need to secure political commitment and momentum through sustained advocacy. Uh, for instance, uh, we could uh, work together on a patient-led uh, white paper with a call to action or a manifesto, uh, and this uh, could uh, uh, help uh, uh, raising awareness, uh, but also uh, we should uh, uh, ask for the endorsement uh, to uh, MEPs. And uh, we need to raise awareness uh, of the severity uh, of AMR, positioning it as a health crisis that could set back many medical advances particularly in a vulnerable population. So we need to find the right hook for policymakers and look at AMR from different angles. We also need to emphasize the patient-centered solutions as they are key driving points, for instance, in cancer advocacy. We also need to leverage public awareness and education campaigns. Uh, we also need to promote collaboration uh, across uh, national boundaries, and this part of uh, uh, this is part of CP's essence. So, to conclude uh, here, uh, cancer advocacy efforts in Europe have uh, benefited from a transnational approach, uh, uh, and uh, the, the best example here is Europe's uh, Beating Cancer Plan. So advocates, us, uh, should uh, encourage the development of a new wide uh, AMR strategy, uh, coordinating research, funding, uh, surveillance, and uh, public health interventions across uh, all member states. Thank you very much, Antonella. And Anna, a question for you. The IMR patient group is developing IMR awareness campaigns and educational material for patient group. As we hear from Antonella, this is really a key point. Uh, what are the skills that patients group and patient advocates need to influence policies more effectively, in your view? Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena, for your question. Um, actually, the answer to that question is kind of at the at the very genesis of the AMR patient group um, that was created in uh, 2020 after a communication campaign that we did with ECDC. And we met a lot of patient groups um, at, the, at that time uh, representing a cancer patients, uh, patients with uh, respiratory issues and, and other issues who are, of course, dealing with uh, AMR, but it was not their primary focus. And that's where we kind of saw the gap and we realized that maybe we could develop an entity that would actually dive into the advocacy and communication and very particular skills to have in uh, relation to the particular topic of AMR. First of all, to profile it better, but also, um, as actually Antonella was saying, to, um, to see that it is an issue per se and not just an unnamed cause and complication of uh, another pathology so we need just to put the focus on amr um and uh, just to reply to your questions i i um isolated four <laughs> four skills that we are focusing on in our work so the first one is the one that we witnessed today actually it's the patient stories this is something that is uh, incredibly important this is uh what is the most driving uh, and we see it in all events. Um, patient stories create emotional connection with the audience and they are actually attracting the attention uh, from, from everybody because it's really putting the emphasis on the issue uh, is actually concerning everyone. It doesn't need to be somebody who is severely sick, somebody who is in the ICU, it can happen to everyone. Um, and what we are trying to do is to help um, patients to deliver these stories, but also to connect with the audience, but also protect them when they are talking about these, these stories, because they are incredibly uh, personal and very intimate. And uh, we are always very grateful when patients decide to actually deliver these stories. Um, the second skill I would say that is important is the knowledge, uh, kind of the technical knowledge about the issue. Uh, so when you are advocating for solutions, you need to know about the whole ecosystem. You are talking about better prevention. You are talking about vaccination. You are talking about screening, med tech, 
uh, but also pharma uh, and new antibiotics, old antibiotics research, the usage of antibiotics. And this is something that is, we are providing this information to our patients because this is information that is, um, and the, the situation is very fragmented all over the EU in different member states. So on national level and then on EU level, we are trying to work for harmonization, but for that you have to have the knowledge to be able to advocate and to go to policy uh, makers uh, with, these, with these questions. For the engagement with policymakers, you of course need to know the ecosystem and the environment you need to know who to talk to and when. So this is also um, information that we are we are providing to our patients. Um, we are, as you said, we are providing uh, materials. Um, you have to have leaflets. You have to have uh, language communication, easy communication, uh, depending on the on the audience that you are addressing. And uh, last but not least, this is what we are doing today. It's the collaboration and networking. You need to be able to speak to different patient organizations, to healthcare workers, to uh, other stakeholders, and to create a whole community around that issue to be really able to um, to put it to the forefront and to to show to the policymakers that it has to be very high on the agenda. And then there is an urgency now. We have been talking about AMR for a very long time, but now it's really urgent. We need concrete solutions. And we need those solutions to be delivered to patients and to be done in a patient-centric way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, um, back again to Diane. Uh, from your interactions with Congress and decision makers, Diane, how effective are patients and patients' representative at influencing policy on IMR? I think patient stories are excuse me, and family stories are the most effective way. And that's why they keep being brought into the conversation. But I wanted to just add a couple of things based on what the other speakers have said, which I think is really important and worth underscoring and should be included in the messaging when they go speak to policymakers. And that is uh, the cause of death. My daughter's death was recorded on her death certificate as cystic fibrosis, but what killed her was a superbug. So that's a very, very important fact that I think will drive home the point that more people are dying and dealing with this than anybody understands. Um, that also leads to the point, which is the task force of survivors and patient stories are critically important and we must hear them, but we also must shine a light on people who have died because subliminally we are conveying the message with the word survivors that this is survivable. We have to start including the messaging that people are dying from this. And until people think that they're dying from this, they're not going to they're not going to understand the severity of it. Because when you see somebody like Vanessa or Rob, you think, okay, they had a hard journey, but they are still okay. And I remember when Madonna went into the ICU with a resistant bacteria, the, the singer that everybody knows worldwide. And I know that people in the inner circle of AMR were talking amongst themselves thinking, wow, we could really use this. But three days later, she was better and she was out. And so she was a survivor. But so that story didn't really help the case. So when you're talking to Congress or when you're talking to policymakers, you have to convey the urgency, not only of the problem for people who are living with it, but how many lives it's taken and how many lives it will continue to take. I think that the actual messaging and what you say is important. And what Hannah said was those four points, get storytellers to help you tell your story better. Make sure you know what you're talking about. I joke that Kevin Outerson, who is the executive director of Carb X, is my Henry Higgins from My Fair Lady because I only knew my own personal story, but he infused me with language. He taught me how to speak to people. He gave me tools that would help me be a better advocate. For example, they taught me that diagnostics are a big part of the problem, and I didn't know that. And to the point about the ecosystem, yes, speakers have to be, people are going to speak publicly, have to be trained. I mean, I did media training for a living. I trained CEOs and celebrities. So I understand that. And I still myself needed to be trained because I didn't know the ecosystem. I didn't understand the complexities, the economics behind it, the different parts, whether it was climate change or poverty or war as a conflict of AMR. 
So once you understand the ecosystem, once you have the language you need, once you have a compelling story, and once you focus on the fact that people are dying, not just surviving, then I think you're going to move the needle in the way that we need to. Thank you. And Antonella, back back to you. As a patient advocates, we are often confronted with different uh, policies, priorities, and limited resources. How do you address this challenge within the cancer community and ensure that IMR remains on the agenda? This is uh, very true, Elena. Uh, we are uh, uh, daily, on a daily basis, uh, confronted uh, with many competing priorities <laughs> and limited uh, resources. So uh, securing attention and funds for AMR can, could be difficult. Uh, the risk is that the cancer and the AMR advocacy may operate in silos, uh, limiting their combine, combined uh, impact. Um, policymakers and the public may not fully grasp the connection between AMR and cancer patient uh, outcomes. So in this uh, situation, in this context, uh, um, potential, potential uh, solution could be uh, highlight how cancer and AMR are uh, strictly interconnected, uh, demonstrate how AMR directly threatens cancer treatment su success in patient survival. So not only quality of life, as it was said, but survival. Uh, positioning is uh, it is a core cancer advocacy issue. Uh, we also need to form uh, strategic alliances, develop a partnership between uh, uh, AMR-focused organizations and other impacted patient groups uh, to amplify the collective voice, share resources, and leverage existing uh, advocacy platforms. Uh, we need to promote uh, data-driven advocacy and patients at the forefront using uh, compelling evidence on AMR's uh, impact on cancer patients uh, to uh, advocate for resource allocation and policy prioritization. We need to enhance capacity building. I mean, all these issues have already been uh, uh, mentioned uh, by the, uh, the, um, the other panelists, but it's very important to train patient advocates on AMR and empower them to effectively communicate the issue and uh, advocate for change, we need to emphasize prevention. Highlight how preventing AMR infections can reduce uh, the healthcare system's burden and improve uh, cancer patient outcomes. We need to collaborate with healthcare professionals. We need to engage oncologists and other healthcare providers uh, to champion AMR uh, awareness and action within uh, cancer and other con condition community. Thank you very much, Antonella and Malin. Um, the UN General Assembly, as we mentioned, um, high-level meeting on IMR is around the corner. Are policymakers ready to make the commitments needed to address the issue of, of IMR? Uh, will they also focus on community um, engagement and uh, patient engagement, in your view? I would say yes and no, <laughs> unfortunately. I mean, we we... If you look at the first high-level meeting in 2016 and the political declaration from that meeting and the engagement around this meeting and, and the preparations, I think we have made a lot of progress. It is a different landscape today. Um, and yes, policymakers are prepared to, to make some of these commitments. In some areas, they're very willing to make commitments, while in other areas, really not. Uh, so if you look at the political declaration, if you compare the final text, which is now available for everyone to read, uh, if you compare it with the zero draft, of course, you will be very disappointed. Um, I mean, that is part of the process. This is how it works in the UN. We negotiate, we come out with something very ambitious, and then to find common ground, we need to, to weaken some of the language. I, however, think that if you really look at it carefully, there are many elements in there that are really important that we have. And with continued commitment and engagement, there's a lot there to build upon. Um, and I think this is really one of the most important messages, that, that this is something we're not done. <laughs> uh, 
this is not the end. This is just one step. And a political declaration is just a political declaration. So if you continue and increase the advocacy, continue educating more policymakers, new politicians. We have new politicians all the time. You know, we have to keep it high on the agenda, obviously. Um, and then I think we, we do have um, a good, a very good new starting point. It's it's just a declaration, but there is there, there are agreements in there that we can take forward. And that's up to, I think, very much the AMR community. And then I mean the entire AMR community, including um, all, all actors. It's, it's about uh, academia, obviously. It's about uh, civil society, especially this kind of, of strong voices as the patients group can uh, be, but also private sector, for example. So we, we have a good chance, but we, we really have to continue this, this uh, strong advocacy work. Thank you very much, pa uh, Malin. We are uh, heading towards the end of this panel, so I will ask each of you um, one final sentence. What is the p one piece of advice you would give to patients and patient groups that want to become more involved in the IMR debate? And I will um, call your name so it's going to be easier to, to contribute. Um, Diane, you first. I have a lot of experience as a storyteller and a professional PR marketing person. And the reason I started the Global AMR Diary was to highlight the work of all the different groups who are collecting stories in silos. They're all on one site. And Vanessa, during this Zoom, I actually reached out to Jennifer Burke from Partnership to Fight Infectious Disease, who is controlling the website to add the AMR narrative. If you go to the Global AMR Diary, you will see all the groups that are collecting stories. You can click through to them. It's really, really important that everybody come together in one place because everybody has their own voice. So what I can offer as your takeaway is please come together, hopefully through the Global AMR Diary because the World Health, the CDC, the ECDC, lots of groups are there. And if we can take all of these stories and really amplify them, then perhaps people will start to listen. The, adv the advice in PR we, we say is, you can't, it's hard to boil an ocean, right? It's hard to boil an ocean. But if you actually put together all the people who have done hard work for year after year to try to raise awareness, and you can put them all together in one room, you will make some noise. And we need to make some noise to put an end to this silent pandemic. Thank you very much. Um, and then Malin, please. Well, I think we, we talk a lot about the narrative that AMR is so technical, it's easy to distance yourself from something that sounds like, you know, it's just an acronym. So I think that is a really important thing. Don't allow people to, to hide behind that and distance themselves from AMR, but talk about what it really means. Uh, contribute with more voices, with more perspectives, because we all listen to different messages and, 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 and different really um, experiences so you know don't hesitate just continue this important work uh, fantastic antonella uh, well i would uh, add to identify the right evidence and key messages uh, that uh, resonate with the specific target audience uh, uh, you have identified it's it's very important uh, and also I can echo what has been said before, collaboration is key. Uh, there is a strength in uh, numbers and we have the power to put pressure on policymakers uh, to bring about policy positive uh, uh, actions uh, that can mitigate, if not eliminate, the risk of uh, AMRs. Um, wonderful. And uh, Anna? Yeah, well, a, a lot has been said already, so <laughs> at the risk of repeating what uh, my fellow panelists said, I think that the most important thing is really the um, communication and collaboration. So communication in the way that we have to simplify the communication about AMR uh, to really be able to pass the message to all audiences, uh, not only to policymakers, but also to healthcare workers and to install a dialogue really between patients and 
healthcare workers, um, industrials, med tech, et cetera, and, and policymakers, of course. And also the connection between the different issues. We have to really put the AMR in a perspective with um, prevention, vaccination, screening, the antibiotic usage, and the fact that we can all come together, um, as it has been said, work together, uh, combine our skills, and uh, and uh, be able to convey the message that it is an everybody's problem, but it can also be an everybody's solution. Uh, so I think that that would be very the important messages of today. Thank you very much, Anna. And I hope I didn't forget any of the panelists. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for contributing to these discussions and the speakers uh, before. Um, it's been, I think, a great a great journey for, for EPF and IMR narrative. We organized this uh, three uh, webinars um, on, uh, on antimicrobial resistance, and it's been an incredible uh, learning journey for me uh, personally and for, for our team for EPF, and uh, really a great um a great learning learning experience uh, and we hope that this is very interesting for you for you as well those three webinars will be available online so currently we have available the first and the second one already and this the webinar that you are uh, participating in will be available shortly also on our channels but also on the um imr narrative channel um yes our, our colleagues posted in and the questions all of the two uh the two webinars um and i would like to take a moment to thank the imr narrative and san francesca for this fantastic uh collaboration and all the epf staff that contributed the lila jan claudia and laura to these webinars and uh, um we have currently uh just really uh one minute um if if there are any any question or if you would like to reach out to us afterwards for comments questions or requests uh, for more material you can reach out to uh, policy at eu patients.eu or admin at the imr narrative.org we will also send a follow-up email with uh, the material for for this webinar and we really hope that this has been uh, useful uh, for you and that uh, this will be, uh, you know, a great start or a great enhance of your advocacy journey into IMR. Thank you everyone for watching and uh, see you next time.